All right. Well, thank you. Um, before we really get started here, there is this URL you see uh, for this first day. I'm going to be a bit of an outlier. I have my stuff in my own place for the moment. That will be corrected. But if you go there, it's everybody. And it's case sensitive, by the way. So you have to spell Nimbus the way it's spelled on flyers and things. Is anybody having trouble accessing that? Should be a very simple website. Okay, so there you should uh, find this exact set of slides. Okay, has anybody not had a chance to go there yet? Okay, so you'll see a few things. Uh, at the top, you'll see a link to uh, some. I, I think I called it RStudio in the cloud or something, I don't know. So we have a few resources uh, running on Amazon's EC2. Uh, you click that link, it'll randomly send you to one of them. They're all the same. Um, you will need login information. So just take one of these as they come to you. Oops. Here you go. So if you study several of these passwords, you'll find that we are using the version of uh, crossing our fingers security. But um, OK, sure. But you can use the account information that you see on that slip of paper to log in to that resource. That is a multiple user resource of an AMI that we are going to give to you that does not have all of these extra users on it has a lot of R packages installed on it. It has uh, R Studio Server installed on it. Everything that we're going to be touching, hopefully, across all presenters in this workshop, in terms of R packages, is already there. And I think this afternoon we're going to have some time to get you set up with your own uh, so that you can use that resource. Uh, if, as everybody tries to log into this thing at the moment, I hope we have enough resources. Maybe something interesting will happen. We'll see. Uh, these things are always, these live things are always very exciting. Uh, so has everybody had a chance to go to this website? Okay, so when you do, you should see something like this. Uh, so this is where you would be able to log in. That account information is also, by the way, SSH information. Uh, it's, it's the exact same. It's just a Linux username. So when you, when you click one of these, you will see, oh, I don't have internet connectivity. Well, if you did that and you had internet connectivity, then you would see uh, an IP address there. That's the IP address you could SSH into if you wanted, using that exact same account information. Here, this EC2 launch uh, tutorial, that's the information you're going to need to help you set up your own instance uh, later this afternoon. Uh, OK. So let's get started. So we have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, after watching the first session, I get the feeling that uh, there, there's a pretty broad range of, of experience with high-performance computing and R. Uh, so this is a, this is a broad overview. Okay? There are a lot of things, probably for every person, that are going to be review, or maybe a, a stricter specification of things you've heard of and know about, and hopefully some new stuff. And then tomorrow, we'll have a session on uh, a utility called PBDR, which is a, uh, which is a, um, a set of R set of R packages for using R on supercomputers effectively. And then on Tuesday we'll have a session on uh, interfacing R to compiled code with RCPP. But this is just the broad overview. Okay, so a quick introduction: uh, what what compute resource, resources are available to you. So you have your laptop or your desktop or whatever. You could buy your own server and manage that. That's an option, of course. Many of you probably do that. There's the cloud, which we will be using here. And then there's also NSF resources, which got a nice plug at the end of the last session. So Exceed is a really bad acronym for a really good organization. It stands for Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. OK. Um, some, some different things about Exceed. This is a cyber infrastructure program. Uh, it is free with an asterisk. Uh, you know, void where prohibited, some restrictions may apply, that kind of thing. Uh, we can talk very briefly about that. 
but you have some access to absolutely massive compute resources. Uh, some of the biggest computing resources on the planet. Um, and we'll, we'll actually get to look at one of those anyway. Uh, the OS image and software is managed by others. I call that a plus. I suppose that could be a minus. Um, if, you, if you need something installed, you would either need to do it yourself in your own, for example, on Lustre. This is common. Um, this can be annoying if you're not used to how these things are managed. Supercomputers, these remote HPC resources, tend to be run a little bit differently uh, than other kinds of remote resources you may be familiar with. Uh, so maybe you want something installed and you really need help, so you have to contact somebody and it filters through and there's maybe some iteration. So it could be a minus. Or if it's already there and set up, that's, that's very easy. It's very nice. Um, you do have to apply, and applications tend to take one to three months. Um, the application, as opposed to with Amazon, you can't just say, here's my money. It's free. So you have to fill out some kind of request. Um, the kind of compute resources you need and how much of them you want uh, will affect the length of that application. There are startup allocations where you really can just say, I want to play with this thing, and pretty much they'll let you, as long as you are NSF-able, and probably most of us are here. Um, if you're not, then you fall under the asterisk, perhaps. But um, if, you, if you want something bigger, if you want, for example, there are consulting services where you can get help actually running things or, or porting software, scaling software. Uh, then you may have to fill out a stronger kind of application. And as I say, there are restrictions. This is the website uh, if you are interested in looking into getting an allocation. Um, so what is high-performance computing? I really like this definition uh, because it's very broad. Um, so high-performance computing most generally refers to the practice of aggregating computing power in a way that delivers much higher performance than one can get out of a typical desktop computer or workstation in order to solve large problems in science, engineering, or business. Very, very, very broad definition, but it's sort of useful. Um, HPC is one of these terms like big data, except people, for some reason, are more grumpy about the term big data. Uh, HPC, you know, it could refer to just utilizing multiple cores uh, within a single node. It could mean utilizing a GPU, uh, which is a little harder, an Intel Xeon Phi, which is, at the moment, harder still. It could mean you know, utilizing some very large distributed resource. It can mean all kinds of things. Uh, some myths about high-performance computing. We'll talk more or less about some of these just very briefly. Uh, the number one, we don't need to worry about it. And then number seven, uh, Every question requires an HPC solution. Both of these are false. Uh, there are plenty of great, interesting questions that are best solved with you know, insights from small data. That's fine. That's never going to go away. But at the same time, not everything is solvable with uh, you know, you know, 10 rows and, and three variables. right? Um, HPC doesn't require a supercomputer. It's not only for academics. Uh, too expensive, well, depends on for whom. If the government's paying for it, you know, who, whose expense is it? That's maybe iffy. Uh, you can't do HPC with R. This is my favorite. I have quite a lot to say about that. Uh, there's no need for HPC in biology. Well, that's false, and I have a great slide for that. I hope you will agree. Here are just a few companies I could think of off the top of my head. You see there's lots of um, tech companies there. And then Johnson & Johnson which is a bit of an outlier. And in fact, the application that I happen to know that they were using supercomputing for was a bioinformatics application, I think at the San Diego Supercomputing Center. You can find about that uh, elsewhere. But this company believes that there is profit in bioinformatics supercomputing. So that's sort of cool. Uh, you can't do HPC with R. Well, I disagree. Here's my argument. We developed this stuff called PBDR. This is a benchmark we ran on Kraken. Here we show from. Uh, 504 to 24,000 cores. We actually ran it up to 50,000 cores, but we only have this one run. Explaining this benchmark, this is a uh, it's, it's so-called weak scaling benchmark. So what we're trying to do is we're fixing a local problem size of about 44 uh, megabytes. And ideally, this would be completely flat. We're not looking for this kind of picture. We're looking for these things being completely flat. 
because as we increase the amount of resources that we have, we're proportionally increasing the amount of, uh, of data that we have. So, so the local data size is fixed. And then we just keep increasing resources and see what happens. And this is fitting, fitting a, a linear model uh, where we have 500, 1,000, and 2,000 predictors, and then just a whole bunch of rows to fill everything out, distributed across a whole bunch of different uh, nodes. As I say, we actually ran this out to 50,000 cores, but only for this one. And I think it's just nice to see the different ones. Uh, and the runtime is plotted here. You see at 24,000 uh, cores with uh, 500 predictors on the numbers here are the total size in gigabytes. So that's roughly a terabyte of data uh, ran in like 30 seconds. So uh, you can indeed do high performance computing with R. Uh, bio, uh, biological sciences, bioinformatics, high performance computing. So I found this, uh, this, this fellow, uh, uh, Manuel uh, Peitsch, I'm not sure how to say his name, co-founder of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. He says HPC is, quote, essential and plays a critical role in life sciences in the following four ways. That there are massive amounts of data generated by modern omics and genome sequencing technologies. So a little bit about, uh, about me. My background is mathematics. Uh, I'm not a biologist. I don't know much about biology, but I try real hard. And uh, as I understand, you have these giant machines. You press a button, and out tumbles this giant pile of data, right? <laughs> so um, as the pile of data gets bigger and bigger out of these push-button machines, the need for supercomputing resources grows. Um, he says, and these are basically just chopped up direct quotes from this guy. I'm not putting words in his mouth. Uh, modeling increasingly large biomolecular systems using uh, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, using MCMC methods. Um, modeling biological networks and simulating how network perturbations lead to adverse outcomes and disease. I don't really know what that means. That probably means more to you than me. Uh, and then simulation of organ function. That sounds pretty neat. So these are all just examples of high performance computing in the biological sciences. So as I said, this is a very, very, very broad overview. We're going to be talking about everything from profiling, uh, better serial R, using compilers, uh, overview of parallelism, some basic parallel R stuff, distributed R, and then I have a few exercises you can take a look at on your own. Um, so now we're going to talk about profiling. Okay. Profiling is something I'm pretty passionate about because um, th there's just no good reason not to do it. And I see a lot of people who don't. They think they understand where their bottlenecks are. You take a look at their code. They're completely wrong. They've wasted everyone's time. So uh, you really, really, really need to come to appreciate profiling. Why profile? Because performance matters. Okay? Even in R, where you take an automatic performance hit, and we'll not get too into all the different ways that is true. You take similar performance hits with Python and Julia to varying degrees depending on what you're doing. Um, but you will take a performance hit over, for example, using C or Fortran. Of course, these are easier to use than C and Fortran. Uh, and at the same time, performance matters. You can't just say, ah, somebody else will fix it later. Uh, you, know, you, you need to be good stewards of your own methods and code. Your bottlenecks may surprise you. Okay. So the things you think are holding you back and really, really, really slow, when you start scaling up, you'll find that maybe it's a sort of upfront fixed cost and then something else you thought was very trivial is ballooning out of control. Uh, that's pretty common. R is dumb. R is fantastically stupid. And I have some great examples to, to convince you of this, I hope. And my final one is, is, uh, is my, you know, my own up uh, condition. R users claim to be data people, so act like it. Generate your own data. Understand your own methods computationally. Even if you, you may not understand exactly what R is doing, because R is very complicated, when you apply some method, you can at least understand its effect. And that's what profiling is all about. So R is dumb. And here's an example. This is the lowest level we're going to get, so just bear with me. Um, in C, so this is some C, uh, some C code, where we have a for loop. And at each iteration of the for loop, I set the variable, the integer variable, x equal to 1. Okay, that's the C code. If I compile that with optimization, and I'm using Clang, it's just a C compiler. If I compile that with optimization uh, level 3, this is the assembly that Clang produces. 
We don't need to know what it means. All we need to know is this is the assembly that it produces when you compile without optimization. It's doing a whole lot more, right? What's the difference? The difference is with optimization, the compiler realized, oh, the programmer's a moron. Uh, they're setting x equal to 1 every time. Let's not actually do that. We'll just throw away this loop, set x equal to 1, call it a day. Without optimization, it's going to do exactly what I asked for. Okay? The thing on the left, or uh, the thing on your right here, that is, that is what R is going to do. It's going to do what you tell it. Whereas a compiler, uh, for example, in a C compiler, a Fortran compiler, can often make these kinds of improvements. R will not. Okay? In R, for example, and, and this, is, this is fabricated, taken from a real thing, but uh, some fake stuff fabricated. Um, you see operations like this every now and then in people's code. You'll see you know, something like inside this for loop, we'll set the transpose of A, so we'll store TA equal transpose of A. Or maybe they don't even do this. They just compute it each time here. They'll just say T of A, they'll take this and put it there, right? Each, notice we don't modify TA elsewhere. We just take the transpose of this matrix, whatever the data actually looks like, and whatever this is actually doing, who cares? Uh, just looking at the design pattern, uh, we're taking the transpose each iteration of this loop. R is not as smart as a compiler. R is not going to realize what you meant. R is going to do exactly what you tell it and actually compute that transpose each time. And because R is a functional language, a language without side effects, or quasi-functional anyway, uh, each time you do this, you're generating a new copy of the data in A, each and every single time. Okay? Very, very, very expensive as the data sizes grow. Over here, if you allocate things up front uh, that aren't being changed within the loop, you'll get much better performance. So you have to be sensitive to these kinds of issues. You, you may already be, but it's worth just hammering the point home, R won't fix bad code. Okay? Compilers don't really, for the most part, but they, they can pick out some simple things like this. Um, this is an example, another example of the value of profiling. So there is a package on the CRAN called Cluster Genomics. Uh, it, I was just looking on the CRAN for various bioinformatics packages one day, got sort of curious. I found this, it looked interesting to me. Maybe it doesn't look interesting to you, I don't know. But it looked neat to me. So I take a look at it, I run his example data, and it takes like 10 seconds. So I look at how big his data is, and it's like 15 rows, two columns. Like that's unreasonable. I don't know what he's doing, but it doesn't make sense. Uh, so I, I profile his code. I just run a very simple profiler. Um, we'll talk about what I used, I used rprof. And I saw there was a function find w living in there, where all of his time was being gobbled up. So I looked at it, and after about three seconds, I realized what the problem was, just from looking at it. Okay? Uh, and I didn't have to dig through any of the rest of his code. The profiler told me where I should start looking. As soon as I did, I saw the problem. Each iteration of some loop, so he, he cooks up this weird matrix he calls dx. And dx is some distance matrix in R. And each iteration, he casts it as a matrix inside of this loop, each iteration. Well, each time he does that, uh, this distance matrix is, is, is really large that he's cooked up relative to his problem size. It's really large, let's say. So each iteration, he's casting this thing as a matrix. And it's a very expensive memory operation. So I just pulled it out front. I just moved, I changed two lines of code, two lines of code. And I improved the performance of his package 350% on his main method. It took me 10 minutes, right? I emailed the guy. He never wrote me back. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to utilize it or not. But uh, maybe if you are, please see me. We have some things to talk about. But um, that could be. I, I, have, I have plenty of passive aggressive things to say about the CRAN. But... Um, so this is the value of profiling. You, know, you really need to understand at least the effect of what your implementation is doing. Because R offers all this really nice high-level stuff. It's, it's tempting to just like crank out the first thing and then push it to CRAN and call it a day. But you, know, you need to be sensitive to these kinds of performance issues. OK. So uh, measuring performance, there are, there are some simple ways to do it. 
There's system.time, which probably everybody is aware of. We'll very just briefly look at what it is and what it does. But um, it's a very important, uh, simple way to sort of see what your bottled up uh, mega function is doing in terms of, in terms of like, you know, absolute performance. Our benchmark is a really handy package that I really like and recommend, and we'll look at that. Um, if you are, uh, by the way, uh, ha has anybody had issues connecting to that uh, RStudio? You had issues. Did anybody not have issues? <laughs> OK. So um, everything is case sensitive. I'll reiterate. Maybe try that again. Or maybe there was some hammering of the, of the, 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 the hardware. Um, on that resource, all of these packages and things are installed, so you could poke at them and prod at them. And, and eventually, you'll have your own instance running with all of that stuff. Um, and then the final one is rprof, which you've probably heard of, may not have used. rprof is really, really powerful for our programming. So system.time, this is the basic R utility uh, for giving runtimes of expressions. So if we just cook up some random matrix with 10,000 rows, 500 columns, and we compute t of x, percent star percent is matrix matrix multiplication x, so computing the transpose of x multiplied against itself. We time it with system.time, it produces this. So especially for serial things, you can probably just ignore those two. Everybody just wants to know the, the elapsed time. This is a wall clock time. More about that later. Um, another thing you could do is cross prod. So cross prod, notice this is much lower time. These do the exact same thing. So here is sort of the issue with R where you have all of this high level expression. How do you find the right one? Um, this cross prod is a more efficient version of this. And if you reverse the order, T cross prod is the other one. Uh, just an interesting point to bring up. Covariance involves a calculation like this and then some other things. And you see that's yeah, much more expensive. But this is how system.time works. Probably no surprises. At any time, feel free to stop me with questions. I like interactivity. We're our users. We like interactivity. So feel free to stop me with questions. Right, sure. sure, yeah. Um, when is system, so system.time, so I, I've had weird issues with this sometimes, like mm -hmm. you are distributing something. Sure. And then you time the distributed. So like, I want to know whether it's actually parallelizing. Mm -hmm. Just wrap the whole thing to system.time. Sometimes I get crazy results. Mm -hmm. Is it doing something different in parallel? It... System.time? Yeah. System.time should not be. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. If you're using, if you, so right, right. say, if you're just not inside parallel, but outside, timing the parallel. Right. So suppose you're, for example, using like RMPI yes. is where we're headed. Yes. OK, so if you're using RMPI, for example, and you're, you're, you're spawning a bunch of uh, workers with RMPI, and you're doing some things in parallel with those workers, and you time that whole expression, um, System.time is just system.time. RMPI doesn't touch it. It's doing the same thing. So I guess I'm not sure what the... What the sometimes the, three don't, the first two don't add to the second. Ah, that's, that's fine. And, and we, we could maybe discuss that. But um, So the idea is, um, well, maybe a bit beyond the scope for the moment. Sorry, so um, we'll, we'll hopefully return to this. Uh, so. Here's just another example. Um, Nick Matsky in the back here. Uh, he is a postdoc at Nimbus. And uh, he, has, he has this biogeography package, BioGeoBears, which should be on that image. Um, cap B, Cap G, Cap B E A R S, I believe. Oh, uh, capital. 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 I'm a biologist, not a, like, a real <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, oh, OK. So uh, he has this package that he utilizes called Rexpo Kit. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, so Rexpo Kit performs uh, matrix exponentiation. So one of the things that uh, he and I were working on was trying to make that faster. Matrix exponentiation is one of the key parts of his, uh, uh, key computational parts of his, his biogeography analysis, uh, especially as things scale. This thing is just really slow and really compute bound. Compute bound inside of R in a way that most other things are not compute bound. It's a very interesting problem. We'll have a lot more to say tomorrow. But um, this was the method uh, originally. I, I, I changed the way that 
the, the compiled code is interfaced. And without even touching the methods themselves, we were able to produce like a 30% speed up uh, on average. Uh, we were able to do better than that, as we'll see tomorrow. But, but again, you know, just, just simple system timing. It answers the question, which of these implementations is better? Right, lower number is better. Um, our benchmark it goes a little bit beyond that. So whenever you are, um, whenever you are calling functions in R, there's usually a first call overhead. And so if you're really devious, you can craft benchmarks that make your implementation look way better than somebody else's, even if they're really fairly comparable. Uh, benchmarking can be very much an art, and you can fool a lot of people uh, if you're a fairly unethical person. So our benchmark tries to uh, at least solve one of those issues. And just very simply, if you have, for example, functions f and g, f is tx times x, g is just cross prod of x, these things we saw earlier, they do the exact same thing. We're trying to see which of these is better. Well, we can uh, do library r benchmark and then kick off the r. The function is just benchmark, f evaluated at some data. It's the exact same data as before. Uh, G evaluated at that data, and it spits out all of this kind of stuff. I've actually uh, thrown away some of it, but one of the key things that it shows is, well, it shows you your test, so F, G, the number of replications. So it's doing each of them here 100 times. You can tune that to whatever you like. Uh, it shows the total elapsed times across um, all of these replications uh, for each individual piece and then a relative performance. So if G is 1, then F is you know, twofold worse. So here, for the relative performance, lower is better. Uh, 1 is, is, is the standard by which the others are defined. So we can see very quickly that um, you know, in a real average case, at this scale of data, and the scale will make a huge difference, um, that G is really much better than F. It's about two times faster. So our benchmark is a really handy tool, and especially if you're going to be comparing across uh, packages, methods like that, um, this, is, this is a much uh, more um, intellectually honest way to do things, let's say. And you could do it yourself. You could, you, know, you could crank this thing out yourself, but it's just a simple package that does one thing very well. And so why not use it? Okay. And, and as, as I said, as questions come up, feel free to ask. Uh, I do reserve the right to punt, and, and we will return. But uh, um, OK, so our prof. Our prof is the much, much, much more versatile tool for profiling. Uh, so here is, the, here is the, the calling interface for our prof. It's a core utility. It's cooked into R. So uh, you have all of these options. We're not going to look at most of them. But we'll take a look at a simple example here. You're probably familiar with the IRIS data set. We're going to kick out some of the values of it and call that MIRIS. And um, we'll form a logistic regression model on what remains. I'm not saying that the model itself is particularly clever I'm just, or, or reasonable. I'm just using it as, a, as an example. So the way this works is you would say, for example, rprof open close paren. You could also put in characters the name of a file. That's an option as well. And then you do whatever, the, the computing. So we're fitting uh, a notice with, with one replicate. We're fitting a generalized linear model. And I have a reason for this replicate business. Just bear with me. Uh, then I call rprof null. That is how we stop profiling, is you call rprof null. Um, if you do that again, it's basically just going to reset. You have to call null. And then there's a summary function for rprof, summary rprof. Uh, and we can even look at this together. So hopefully, OK. So it spit out a whole bunch of warnings for the GLM fit. We don't care. We're not interested in that. We're just interested in rprof for the moment. Um, so we stop profiling. I say summary rprof. And oh, I actually got things. I'm surprised. So um, here we see the function git took 0.02 seconds, 100% of compute time. You think that's the only thing that GLM is doing? Uh, probably not. Why is it only showing this weird subset? 
So the reason, and something that tends to be confusing for first-time users, uh, there's this interval. And the way this works is really more complicated than I want to get into. But basically, um, the idea is, like every interval seconds, uh, it's, it's going to, to basically check the stack. We don't want to get into that. The point is, uh, things that by default take no more than 0.02 seconds across the compute aren't going to show up. They're just not going to be present, visible, in the summary. So if we did, for example, 10 replicates, we would expect to see more things because there's more stuff taking more time. So we can evaluate that. And um, let's just clear that. And you see there's a whole lot more stuff now. OK? So interpreting this uh, takes a little bit of time. Um, by total tends to be the first thing I want to look at. So L apply, that's coming from the replicate uh, statement. Fun, so this is within that. GLM. So we're basically just going down the list of, of like calls from, from outer to inner where all the computing is happening. Uh, so inside of GLM, or no, no, here we are. So inside of uh, Replicate, there's an S apply. Uh, we don't need to worry about that. That the dot call that's calling uh, compiled code. So about 33% of that is in compiled code, and the rest is basically memory management inside of R. Just as an example, and we could do a hundred replications, and we should probably see something different still. Now we see a whole lot of stuff. See, um, there are different tools available to try to help you uh, parse and interpret this stuff. Summary RProf is just a core utility that they offer. Um, this fits into Brian Ripley's perspective of what is reasonable. Uh, maybe you agree or disagree with that. Hadley Wickham has a package called ProfR, I think, that will plot these things. So you say RProf into a file just in character, in quotes, rprof of a file. You do your, you do your computing, rprof null, uh, then you call uh, his, his profiler plotter command on that file, and it will visualize it for you. Um, these have different utility. They do different things. But this is, this is the first thing that I'm interested in. If somebody hands me some code and says it's slow, the first thing that I want to do is I want to understand what are their use cases, like what do, you know, what's the size data, you know, give me some example data, at which scale you consider this thing slow, and then I just run that and see what I get. And then that tells me where I need to start looking. There are other profiling tools available. So um, RProf Mem is the memory version of RProf, a little bit beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, so you can do memory profiling. Uh, there's no summary rprof mem, so that sort of goes away. You have to um, dump to a file and read things in sort of manually. It's not too bad, but interpreting it is a lot harder. <laughs> I just don't want to get into it at the moment. Uh, trace mem is a really handy thing if you think extra copies are being made of an object. So if you have an object X, a matrix or something, or a data frame, and you think unnecessary copies of it are being produced, Every time a copy is produced, once you call it inside of trace mem, it'll basically tell you that there was a copy. It can be very useful. Um, there's perf in Linux, which goes way beyond the scope of what we want to talk about at the moment, but is a very useful tool too. Um, is like a beefier version of rprof for the whole R ecosystem. Pappy and Tal, these are libraries specially devoted to profiling uh, compiled code and MPI. We have a Google Summer of Code proposal at the moment, which um, we're optimistic we're going to get a slot this year. We got one last year. Uh, we're optimistic we will get another. And the goal is to bring in all of Pappy and some of Tau and make that very easy to use to profile. So especially if you're writing compiled code and using it in R, as we will talk about on Tuesday, then hopefully we will have a very good tool for you by September. Um, there's also PBD or, or PBD Prof, which was a successful Google, Cummer, Google Summer of Code project that we had last year. Um, so Google Summer of Code 2013, uh, what you do is if you're doing stuff with MPI packages, okay, so there's really two um, main ones, let's say, and then extras on top. So there's PBD MPI and there's RMPI uh, inside of the PBD Prof 
vignette. We explain how you would uh, utilize this package with either of those. But if you get to MPI land, as we'll talk about tomorrow, this is a handy way to profile. You can, you can basically look at, um, once we know what MPI is, this will be more compelling. But uh, you can look at the size of messages that are getting passed around. You can look at the number of MPI calls that are getting made underneath. And it just really helps you easily understand uh, your MPI code. OK, so quick summary. Uh, profile, profile, profile. You have to, have to, have to profile. You have to just get into this mode where if you really care about performance and scalability, you have to be willing to uh, get your hands dirty with RProf at the least. This is not time is good to get general sense of what's going on for like your main outside method of just to get a simple uh, timing. Our benchmark is good for comparisons. Uh, RProf is, is really the one for getting your hands dirty, I would argue. Other tools exist for more hardcore applications, but um, you know, for, for living just purely inside of our code, our prof is probably enough. Um, may depend on the application, but for most, our prof is sufficient. Okay, so any questions before moving on to using writing better R code in general? Okay, so. Uh, this one is probably a lot of review, um, but before we talk about parallel R and parallelism in general, uh, and certainly before we want to talk about distributed computing, which is much harder, um, the point should be made that slow serial code produces slow parallel code. And so if you're not making good use, use of the resource in serial, you're not going to be making good use of the resource in parallel either. Um, parallelism may speed things up, but you know, you go to 16 cores, maybe you get 15, 16 fold speed up, cross your fingers, you really hope that's what you're going to get. Uh, but maybe by refactoring your code, using a little bit of compiled code, before you even get to parallelism, you could speed it up by 100 fold, right? So these, these, are, these are really powerful improvements that you could get. Uh, a little bit about function evaluation. I don't see this too often, but it's worth bringing up. Function calls are comparatively, and by that I mean like to C or Fortran expensive. So about 10 times slower than C, but that's on the order of like nanoseconds. It's really not worth worrying about. In absolute terms, the abstraction of multiple modular functions together uh, is totally worth it. Try to avoid building super functions because that's harder to profile. You know, you want independent compute pieces all working together. Even though there is an overhead to a function call, it's worth it, trust me. Um, Recursion, however, avoid at all costs. Recursion really sucks in R. So here's a simple example that I cooked up to be worst possible. Happens to be easy. How nice. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Fibonacci numbers. So um, indexing from zero, the, the zero Fibonacci number is one, the first is one, and then all those above are the sum of the previous two. You've probably heard of this at some point. Okay. Happens to be a very nice example for demonstrating how bad R is at recursion. So here's the recursive implementation. So we want the nth Fibonacci number. If n is 0 or 1, we'll return 1. That L means integer, uh, L for integer, obviously. So uh, otherwise, we'll return Fib1. So we're making a recursive call of the previous plus Fib1, another recursive call to the one just before that. Simple, very easy to understand. You've probably seen this before. The explicit, um, the non-recursive implementation, it's exactly the same except here, I just expand the recursion. Uh, so it's not really worth spending a lot of time on, but you know, you start with um, your zeroth and your first, and you wait until your, um, you could do a for loop, doesn't matter. You wait until your iterator is just uh, below the number, the, in, the index that you want, and you compute Fibonacci numbers exactly in the scheme that you know how to compute them, return it. OK. So um, here with our benchmark, I ran with n equal to 20, so the 20th Fibonacci number. We ran Fib1 in, Fib2 in. So in, at that scale, uh, the recursive one is over 1,000 times slower. That's pretty bad. but. Um, because of how R handles memory, it, so R is particularly bad at recursion for a reason that's kind of tricky. But um, if you were to take n equal to 45, 
Okay. Then in seconds, right, uh, our system dot time will actually return zero for the non-recursive implementation. You can get the timing; it's three times ten to the minus five, almost instantaneous. This number here, almost 3,000 seconds, that's not even the full runtime. That's just as long as I felt like letting it run for before I finally killed it. So let's say it was just about to finish. Right? Basically, I ran it up, I went to a meeting, I came back, it was still going. I was outraged and I killed it. Um, <laughs> let's say it was almost done. Right? It's still 95 million times slower <laughs> than the non-recursive implementation. So that's, that's pretty bad, right? Yes? Mm -hmm. It's a problem in any language. Of course. Of course. So is there an example of, I'm talking about Python, sure. any language that the person that the person is there. Is there a reason to think that our is bad with recursion? There is. Efficient recursion algorithm? So th this is a problem of, of really any language, especially interpreted languages. Uh, I chose this. Yeah, sure. No, I understand. I understand, but especially for interpreted languages, this is an, th this is this number will be bigger for interpreted languages because of how memory is handled. I agree. You're absolutely correct. I'm being a little bit dishonest. You've caught me. I agree. No, 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 no. Um, if you were to compare this in, for example, Python, like the scale would not be this grandiose. R is especially bad at recursion. It is true. I cooked this up to be worst possible case. And if you were to evaluate th these exact implementations, even in compiled code, it would still look ridiculous by comparison. But, but R does have special issues with recursion. OK. Um, so loops, plies, and vectorization. These are special R things. So loops in R are slow. Of course, they're slow in any interpreted language. But uh, again, R seems to be uh, one of the worst in terms of loops. Uh, there are these functions like apply and reduce. These are really just for loops. Some people say, like, use apply. It's better than a for loop. Print the source code. It's literally a for loop. OK? Uh, map, l apply, s apply, m apply. These are different. These are special things. OK? Uh, these are not just for loops. These are special internal things. Vectorization is the fastest of these options, but is much more memory wasteful and uh, can be a little bit harder to do, perhaps. Ply functions, like apply and lapply, they're not really vectorized. Um, even lapply, which is a little bit faster, they look vectorized, but um, underneath, they're actually doing something different. So some best practices, of course, you know, always profile. Make sure you're not just wasting your time refactoring something that's not actually slow. Okay. Um, evaluate how practical it is to rewrite a for loop as an L apply. There's a very good reason why you might want to use L apply in particular. Uh, it can be faster than for loops, not always, usually. Um, but it's, it's easy to parallelize, so that's convenient. Uh, also consider pushing for loops to compiled code if possible. We'll talk about that Tuesday. And then preallocate, preallocate, preallocate. So here are two simple examples that show um, the importance of preallocation, you're probably familiar with them. We'll just sort of hurry through them. Uh, if x is here, I'm just treating as a template number or template collection of numbers. Um, and I loop through i equal 1 to n, n is some specified integer by the user calling this function. And I call combine uh, all of x that exists so far and the square of that value. So really what I want to do is square all of these values from 1 to n stored in a vector, and then, <clears throat> and then return x. This is really bad because we haven't preallocated. So each iteration of this loop, what happens is um, we, when we form c of x i squared, what we do is we form a new vector. We fill it up with what is, so of length, length of x plus 1. We fill it up with x, and then we add uh, the i squared value to the end of it, we call it x repeat. As n grows, the number of memory operations you're doing uh, gets really, really bad, slows things down. You should avoid it. Instead, it's better to do things like x equal integer n, numeric n, whatever. Okay? Uh, and instead of this combination operator, you just uh, dump the value into its index. 
And you're probably not surprised that even for a fairly small value like 1,000, uh, the first one is 2.5 times slower in our benchmark with 100 replications. So that's pretty bad because, again, you know, this is just free speed up. We don't have to think very hard. You know, just pre-allocate the stuff you're using inside of a for loop. This is just a simpler version of that uh, cluster genomics package example that we saw earlier. Um, uh, just just pre-allocate before you do a loop if you do a loop. Okay. Um, if you want to rewrite a loop in terms of some other expression like ply functions, um, there you should just think of them as sort of a higher representation of a for loop. You know, you're applying a function across something, right? Uh, so generally, not much faster. It may be um, the compiler levels things a little bit. We'll we'll have quite a bit to say about the compiler for R, uh, but it levels the playing field a bit. Uh, thinking in terms of LApply can be useful because one of the main shared memory parallelism um, uh, tools for R, you just add two characters to LApply, and then boom, it's running in parallel, which is nice. So vectorization, um, I, I always find vectorization difficult to explain, but um, there are certain functions that are optimized for doing all of these operations at once. So if X and Y are matrices or vectors or whatever, it's much faster to just take x plus y like this than to loop through the rows and columns and then insert indices, even if you're pre-allocating. It's much better to just do something like that, the nice higher expression. Um, things like this, where we have a matrix or a data frame, and I want to just set all the values of the first column to 0, uh, that's a very nice, efficient way to do it compared to looping through the structure inside of R anyway. R norm. You can randomly generate uh, numbers. You're much better off doing R norm within the number that you want uh, inside the call of the function rather than doing a for loop where you do R norm 1 each time. This is much, much, much faster. Uh, so that's what it is. We've, we've all seen it probably at some point. Vectorization tends to absolutely clobber the others uh, but can be much harder to do and uh, can waste a whole lot of memory. Uh, so adding plies and vectorization to the original two examples. So you could do S apply. S is the simplified L apply. So it's just going to, rather than return a list, it returns a vector if, if possible. And here it is. Uh, from the values 1 to n on this function that just takes the index, the value, and squares it. So we're taking this function and applying it to all the members of this list. In a, in a quasi vectorized, it looks vectorized, but it's not really sort of format. Uh, and then here we we just we just uh, do the simple obvious thing, and of course it's much 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 faster to do that. Okay, no big surprise here, right? This isn't groundbreaking or shattering news, but it is important to keep in mind vectorization is very 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 cost effective in terms of runtime speeds in R, even if it can waste a lot of memory. Uh, whereas the slowest, of course, would be looping without preallocation. Um, looping with preallocation can be, uh, it, looping with preallocation is better, but still pretty slow. This is the S apply, and this is the vectorized. And we could do better still, perhaps, moving to compile code, um, thinking about things in parallel, and so on. Okay. Um, here is sort of a uh, slightly larger but still fairly simple example. So you imagine I want to uh, add up for 1 to some index. Uh, if the thing, if the index is even, I want to, to add to it or subtract from it, if you like, the log of that index or otherwise add the log. A very simple example. And I do this for a reason, <laughs> but uh, here's just a simple example. This is what it might look like if we use s apply instead of uh, the explicit for loop here. Okay, so we're just applying uh, here. The fancy pants word for this is a lambda. We're just defining the function sort of in line uh, function um, element i. If the thing is even, return this value. Uh, it will be turned into a list. And then sum will finally add everything up, or I guess a vector with s apply. Um, then here, uh, here we're just being kind of sneaky in how we vectorize things, but this is a vectorized solution 
Now we're spending a lot of time on it. We're using seq.int. This is a faster version of like one colon n. Uh, we're just being a little bit sneaky here. Uh, and then return that value, run uh, from index one to 50,000, benchmark these things in our benchmark. And what do we see? Uh, F3, the vectorized one is the fastest, probably no surprise. F1, that was the for loop, that's the next best, right? And then the one after that is the, the S apply one. And now maybe you disagree with various implementations or something, fine, but uh, just writing the letters S apply isn't automatically faster than a for loop, right? Uh, it can be, and there are reasons why you would want this kind of expression. But, uh, for example, it may be easier to look at this and understand what's going on than to look at this. Sort of depends on your background. And this could be made to look nicer, too, um, depending on how you think about programming, one of these may be more confusing than the other. Uh, so it's a higher expression, which may be useful, but um, they're not inherently faster than the other. Sometimes one wins, sometimes the other. Depends on your problem, really. Okay. Uh, so avoid recursion at all costs. This is true in general if you're a performance uh, concern. Vectorize when you can. Vectorization is very quick. Uh, I say when you can because, again, vectorization can be difficult. You know, if it takes you a very, very long time to figure out how to vectorize, maybe that's not worth it. It can be very memory costly. Maybe that's no longer worth it to you. Um, uh, Preallocate data inside of your loops if you are iterating and inserting into uh, elements inside of a loop. Uh, okay, questions before we go to compilers, at least for a little bit before we break for lunch. Sure. Does S apply create a list and unlist it? That's a good question. Does S apply create a list and unlist it? Probably. Yeah, that's probably. Um, so the so uh, as was as was submitted from the audience, uh, what it probably does is call simplify to array, which is just a simple. It may as well be unlist, frankly. But uh, it, it's nicer. I prefer to call this rather than chaining a bunch of things out if I can help it. OK, so uh, we'll motivate the compiler a little bit uh, with, with um, so the R-level compiler by talking about some other kinds of compilers. Uh, one of the ways you can improve performance in R is by building R with a better compiler. Now, better depends on the hardware uh, and other things, perhaps. But uh, typically, if, if you download R from CRAN, it was probably built with GNU compilers. I think for Mac, they're using Clang now. They're about the same. Um, well, they're about the same in terms of performance. Clang is a much better compiler uh, for, for developers. But they're basically the same. They're using G-Fortran to compile Fortran code. Uh, they're free. They'll compile anything under the sun. They won't complain. Uh, they're very nice. Um, but they don't produce the fastest binaries around. There are other compilers that will produce faster just, just building R with a different compiler would make R faster. Uh, you shouldn't even bother trying to compile anything with R with anything from Microsoft. It's probably not going to work. I'm not aware of anybody who's done it, put it that way. Um, I think they don't even have a C99 compiler, actually. Just don't even go down that route. Uh, Intel ICC is very well known. Um, they have ICC and iFort. Uh, they're fairly expensive. But if you have Intel hardware, I mean, you could expect probably the estimates that I always hear are about 20% over the GNU compilers. So just 20% faster R all around on average just by building it slightly differently. This is assuming some things, and you've got to spend money. But um, a better compiler can mean faster R. So that's good to know. Uh, compiling R with ICC and I4, and there are other compilers. The Portland group has their own compilers that are sort of big and supercomputing. Um, there are all kinds of C compilers out there and Fortran compilers, but um, ICC and I4 are sort of the ones that, if you're going to go to the trouble, usually people use these. And so I bring them up. Uh, you can produce faster binaries, but this is not an entirely uh, painless process. 
It requires Intel Composer suite licenses, and that's very expensive, several thousand dollars a year, I think, maybe. Or maybe that's not expensive to you, right? If that's not expensive to you, then go for it. Um, or if you have access to it through your compute resources, oh, great, maybe consider it. Improvements are most visible on Intel hardware. So they really understand their hardware. They build their compilers to build binaries that really understand their hardware. Probably no big surprise. Um, but if you were to use Intel compilers on different architecture, like AMD, uh, probably you wouldn't see that 20%. You'd see something smaller. Uh, there's a link here, should be clickable on the slides, which uh, Intel has a page just for building R with ICC and MKL, uh, which is a relatively new development. So it's, it's nice. They're, they're acknowledging R. How nice. Uh, so you could see that for details. Um, We'll bring up the compiler package, finish this after we break for lunch and come back here sometime for this one in the afternoon. Although next, I believe, is uh, teaching R? Yes. Um, so just, just to motivate where we will return here sometime this afternoon, uh, released in 2011, it's uh, Luke Tierney, the guy who sort of has his hand in all kinds of HPC things in R. Um, so he's a bytecode compiler. And I don't know of a better explanation for this. Maybe somebody could offer one. I would be thrilled to have it. Bytecode is sort of like machine code for interpreters. That's about the best explanation I know how to give for what it is. Um, I would love comments if you, if you have a, a more intuitive explanation. Uh, it improves R code speed. The, the quoted figure is generally 2 to 5%, depending on what you're doing. And this is completely free, right? It is a completely free speed up. It, it, is, it is so trivial to use the bytecode compiler, there's not a particularly good reason not to. The improvements are 2 to 5 percent, or, or the run times are 2 to 5 percent? The improvements are 2 to 5 percent. That's a very good question. So uh, that would be spectacular, if true. But uh, the improvements when using the bytecode compiler, you expect about a 2 to 5 percent improvement, uh, which isn't great, but it's free. You may as well, right? Uh, and and it, it is expected to get better over time. So why not? And it will do the best on loops. So now we sort of get stuck in this, this, uh, this test of, you know, do we want, do we want loops, compiled loops? Maybe L applies because they parallelize very easily inside of R, or maybe compiled code. And depending on which one of those things you want to do uh, will really depend on your application. But uh, we will finish this up this afternoon talk more about the compiler. For the moment, are there any questions for anything we've covered so far? All right. Well, thank you. And I guess let's grab lunch.